Greetings and welcome to the Kingdom of Grace Ministries Bible Study. This is the first Bible study in the first year of um, 2024. And uh, we say welcome to this Bible study. Uh, this year I'm going to be doing uh, uh, broadcasting the Bible studies live on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Time. So we ask that you join us. So before I get started, I want to tell everybody that's supporting this ministry to thank you for your support, for your prayers. Uh, for your words of encouragement, also for your tithes and your offering and love offering. So we appreciate everything that you do for us, and uh, we're so thankful. Uh, we thank God for this new year, so happy New Year's to everybody today. And as we get started, I'm going to be reading and, uh, reading and studying from Revelation 12 chapter today. And just to kind of give you a heads up, I want to make sure I'm going to be jumping around Revelation. I'm not going to read it chronologically from, you know, Revelation 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be jumping around in chapters, but I'm also going to tie it together. So those that are joining me, I want you to understand I'm doing this intentionally so I can be able to tell a clearer story on what's going on. So as we go through the uh, Bible and go through Revelation, uh, just bear with me. But I'm also going to let you know when I'm doing it and why I'm doing it, okay? So again, today, uh, we're going to be teaching from uh, Revelation, the 12th chapter. And I always like to let people know that I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. So some of the words may not be exactly as your Bible, depending if you have the New King James or uh, a different study Bible. But um, uh, follow with me the best you can. And um, if you have any questions, you know, right now, because I'm doing a live broadcast, I won't have the ability to answer your questions immediately. But um, at some point, I want you to be texting me or email me uh, questions so I can answer them at the next Bible study, whatever questions you may have, okay? So thank you for that. As we get started, a Revelation 12 chapter, um, starting with verse 1, it said, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns on his heads were seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and drew them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with the rod of iron. And a child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there would be nourished for 1,260 days. So I'm going to break this down a little bit for us. It talks about the great sign in, in which you saw a woman. In chapter 12, we're not talking about a woman. We're not talking about Mary, per se, but the woman is symbolic of Israel. So when you see the woman uh, in, appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, it's talking about Israel. And the significance of Israel, when it talks about the sun, and the moon under her feet, those references gives us a clear reference that it's Israel because the clothing of the sun speaks to the glory, God's glory. The moon represent the, when they uh, worship God, they normally worship God, had some ceremony, normally it was always on the, the, the full moon. Uh, of, of um, uh, when they had a worship or did a celebration. So I want you to pay attention to these details because they're very important for us to understand what they mean. Again, 12 stars. What do you mean by 12 stars? Well, that's the 12 tribes. So you have to understand that this depiction of a woman is not Mary per se, but it includes talking about Mary, but it's not Mary. 
we're actually talking about Israel. Excuse me. The Bible says, being labor, being in labor and in pain to give birth, then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, the great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns on his head with, uh, were seven diadems. So I want you to picture this story. We know that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, and he was born in Israel, in Bethlehem. We also understand that Herod, when he understood that the Christ child was born, he sought out the child. He said to worship, but he wasn't going to worship him. His goal was to kill the child. And when he realized that the Magi had deceived him by going a different way in the scriptures in Luke, the Bible was very clear that all of a sudden now, he sought out to kill every child and had every child that was at least two years and under killed and massacred because his plan was to kill the Christ child. Now, what person in their right mind would do something like this? And we know that that was just the influence of evilness trying to stop Jesus from coming into this world. So when it talks about the dragon, it's not literally a dragon standing over where you could see, but symbolically it's saying that here it is, as Jesus was being born, the revelation of Jesus being born, all the signs of Emmanuel coming. You got to understand that the devil knows the Bible. He understands the prophetic word as well. He also understands that there's something that's happening, and he realized that he have to intercept, if he will, uh, the will of God and make do something different. Keep in mind when you look at the book of Job that um, Satan had no problem challenging God. He had no problem challenging God concerning Job. Well, again, you have to realize that he was able to go to and fro. He was able to, when the sons of God met in the holy mountain, of God. He also had access to it. Don't ask me how, I don't know, but he had access into the heavenly realm to when the sons of God, his rank allowed him to be there. But it's going to come a point in the Bible that, that you'll see in this revelation that he will no longer have access, and I'll get to that in a minute. Again, here you have Israel. Israel has been it's been a quiet season of 400 years, 400 plus years of no prophetic word, no prophecy, no anything. And all of a sudden, John the Baptist come on the scene. As John the Baptist come on the scene, right after John the Baptist come on the scene, then you have Jesus come on the scene. Where in this 12th chapter of Revelation, we see that the red dragon is waiting on the child to be born with the mindset of destroying Jesus or destroying the, the Christ child, which I spoke of earlier um, with Herod. But it, as we know, it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because God allowed Jesus and wanted Jesus to come into the world for all of mankind. To the Jews first, and Ju through that lineage, uh, that Jewish uh, lineage is where Jesus came through, but the gospel and salvation is to the Jews first, but not the Jews only. And as we know that right now that many Jewish uh, people do not see Jesus as the Messiah. They see him as uh, uh, a rabbi. They see him as um, even a prophet, if you will. But they don't consider him to be the Messiah. And even though Jesus came with all the signs and wonders and all the miracles and things like that, that was part of what they wanted and what they looked for. But for the Jewish people, they looked for Jesus as warrior king. In other words, we need a king to come to deliver us. And when Jesus came to his first time on earth, that did not happen because God had a different time span for that. And we'll talk a little bit about that with the second coming of Christ, okay? So when you look at, at verse number three, it said, Then another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and seven horn and ten horns. What do the seven 
heads represent. The seven heads represent uh, 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 seven past kingdoms, seven past kingdoms that that was an instrument of creating and wreaking havoc on the world. And so we know that when you look at the past history of Satan, Satan goes about with the same M.O. to destroy, to use things against God, to destroy the things of God, and to consider himself to be God. So we know that different kingdoms that he used, uh, how he used the Babylonians, for example, um, to, to go against the things of God. Same thing when you look at other kingdoms like uh, Rome and, and um, uh, uh, Egypt and, and kingdoms like that. So we just want to keep that in mind when you look at what do you mean by the seven heads? And this dragon having seven heads, no, it's symbolic of the seven past kingdoms or seven past uh, uh, nations that uh, was always coming against the will of God. We know that the ten, it talks about ten horns, will be ten future kingdoms. Ten future kingdoms or, or ten future jurisdictions. And keep in mind that the Bible never talks about the United States of America. But, it, but we do know that one of these ten kingdoms could be the United States or be the West, if you, they may call it the West, or, or some portions of the United States. So just keep that in mind. It says in verse 4, And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and drew them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that she... That, so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. And, and that's what I said earlier. Satan knows scripture. He understands prophecies. So he knows that the child is going to be born. The symbols, like we all know, in Bethlehem. So at the end of the day, here it is. It says this devil. This devil, how do we know he's the devil? It says that his tail drew and swept away a third of the stars. What stars? Talking about the angelic host. Satan was so convincing, so um, uh, charismatic, that he was able to persuade the angelic host, at least one third of the angelic host, to follow him and to follow him to rebel against God. So imagine a particular archangel who is so dynamic, so angelic, so uh, uh, charismatic, and he's able to persuade and draw angels away. How you, do you think that you'll stand a chance against going up to the devil and dealing with the devil? And so that's something we have to think about in our lives. And so when you're looking at Revelation, Revelation is the revelation of John. John, the, the apostle, uh, he had these dreams, right? Or he had these visions. So some people say, well, this haven't happened. This is to, so bizarre. This is not something we think that's going to happen. And I'm saying to you, these things will happen. But you have to know the difference between what is symbolic, what is um, not only symbolic, what is fig figurative, and what is um, uh, the actual. And so I'll try to explain some of that as we go. Uh, but you also need to take the time to read your Bible. Read Revelation. Even if you don't understand it, I'll tell you, read Revelation from 1 through the uh, 22nd chapter. You won't understand it. You're going to have to read it several times. I Even today, I still read uh, the, the, the Bible and read Revelation several times before I come before you. But I want to make sure that I'm accurate in, in my um, commentary and also in my study of this particular uh, um, a book in the Bible. <laughs> Excuse me. The Bible said that the devil sought to destroy the child. What child? Jesus. And we know, you know, he even thought that by, by Jesus being crucified, he thought that that was the end. At the end of the day, he don't know everything, and only to find out that Jesus did rise up from the dead. Hallelujah. Praise God Almighty. And, and as John is describing these things, even John is surprised, by the way, because he's like, okay, all, I, all I'm doing is describing what I can describe based on the lo knowledge that I have at that time. 
And so there's something that I'll point out, maybe not in this particular chapter, but when we come to other chapters, that we can talk about things that he can only give according to his knowledge at the time. John never saw a skyscraper. He never saw a car. Same thing with Ezekiel. Ezekiel saw people going to and fro, these bright lights going to and fro. And that's all he could do is say chariots because there were no cars in this time. So I want you to be aware of that as we are teaching. It says, and this is how we know that we're talking about Jesus in the fifth chapter. It says, and she gave birth to a son, a male child. It's not, let me, let me finish reading before I give you my thought. It says, and she gave birth to a, a son, a male child, who is, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. We know that's Jesus. Her child was caught up to God and his throne which also talks about symbolizing that Jesus was caught up or Jesus was ascended. He ascended up to God after he was on this earth for about 50 days or so. The Bible is clear that after the resurrection of Jesus, he actually, in the book of Acts, first book of Acts, says that he walked around and was around with people, and for 40 days, people saw miracles. Up to 500 people witnessed the miracles and things of Jesus after his resurrection. And after his resurrection, he hung around. And the Bible said that, that Jesus even told them to tarry for a while. And as they were tarrying, the Bible says 10 days later, which 40 days he did miracles. He saw things 10 days later. Then you had the coming of the Holy Spirit and the ascension of Jesus Christ. So Jesus ascended up. And as he was ascending it up, we know that there was wise men, uh, excuse me, angels sitting there saying, uh, men of Galilee, why are you looking up? The same way you see Jesus ascending up into heaven would be the same way he will come down to this very spot which is on the Mount of Olives. And the Bible is telling us specifically when Jesus come back, he will be coming back, setting his feet down on the Mount of Olives. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to segue just a minute because I want to jump into, um, I want to go to uh, Zechariah. Zechariah, um, let's go to uh, the 14th chapter of Zechariah. So if you have your Bibles, go to, just kind of segue with me for a little bit and, and flip on over to Zechariah. Zechariah, the 14th chapter. This is very important because this is symbolic and it's futuristic. This is to come. This prophecy has not happened yet and it's giving us detail. And that is one of the reasons why I'm always telling people you need to pay attention what is happening uh, with Israel today. You need to pay attention what's happening in the Middle East today. You need to pay attention on what's going on in the world today. Because if all you're doing is looking at... Um, uh, your, uh, Facebook and looking at your Twitter accounts and looking at your Instagram accounts and all of these other things, keep in mind it's designed for your profile and your preferences. Sometimes you have to look at other things that's going to give you a different perspective. And that's why I tell people to look at the news. Don't just look at the news that you like. Also look at some news that you just don't disagree with. There's some channels out there you're not going to agree with their point of view. But listen to what they have to say because it will give you insight and you're able to triangulate what the real answers are on what's going on in the world today. So if you go to Zechariah, the 14th chapter, starting with the first verse, it says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. And I'm going to stop right there for a minute. Look at what it's saying. It's saying, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when, when the spoil is taken taken from you will be divided among you I will who is this talking the Lord the Lord is saying I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem against Jerusalem to battle and the city will be captured in other words right now you're seeing this battle and you see this war that's going on you see that that uh, Israel is being pretty much the aggressor in stamping out ha Hamas and and as they're doing that, 
uh, they have a reason for doing that. And as they're doing that, they have waged war against terrorism. But in this particular passage, it's talking about there's going to be an army that's going to come up against Israel. And when they come up against Israel, particularly the Jerusalem, when they come up against Israel and Jerusalem, the Bible is very clear that they will have some success or this, this group that's coming up against them will capture the city, it will plunder houses, the women will be ravaged. When it's talking about women ravaged, it's talking about women being raped. And, and when I think about this war that happened on October the 7th in, in uh, Israel, and some of the graphic details on how when they raped the women and raped the young girls, God have mercy, they were brutal and they were terrible. And so when you see the Bible saying, and they ravaged the women, that's exactly what happened. And so when you see those kinds of things going on, that is nothing to take lightly. Uh, and in this case, in the 14th chapter of Zechariah, is saying that the women of the city of Jerusalem will be ravished. They will be raped. They will, uh, they will capture the city, but they won't capture all of the city. The verb number three said, then the Lord will go up and fight against those nations as when he fight on a day of battle. This is very important. God is saying that I'm the one that allowed this army to come up against the people of God. And it says, as I allowed this nation, I was the one responsible for gathering them together to come up against the nations. But as they're coming up against the nations, you think that all is lost. He said, no, all is not lost. He said, then the Lord will Come, will, will go forth and fight against those nations. What Lord? Who is we talking about at this point? And he says, as when he fight on a day of battle. Look at verse number 4 and 14, 4 in Zechariah. It says, in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is from it, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west to be a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move forward towards the north and the other half towards the south. You will flee by the valley of the mountains, of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach as to Azel, yes, you will flee as you fled before the earthquakes in the day of Uzziah, king of Judah. So here it is, we find in that Jesus Christ, when he put his feet on the Mount of Olives, Jesus is coming to do war. He's coming for battle. And as he say, when I come back, I don't come, I don't come bringing peace. I come with a sword. Praise God, the sword, which is the word of God. And when I wanted to make this this correlation here and to see the significance of the word of God is it's talking about Jesus' feet hitting the ground and touching the Mount of Olives. Uh, if you've never been to um, Israel, and thank God I've had the opportunity and the blessings to go there um, several times, uh, I, I, I seen the mountain of olives. It's not like some high mountains like we have in California, things like that. But yet these are mountains or super hills is what I call them, but they're mountains. And I could just imagine when Jesus' feet hit back where he originally ascended up to heaven from. And I want to go to um, Acts, the first chapter of Acts. And just to read what I said earlier, that... Um, Jesus had, uh, um, he was doing so many things um, during his time uh, when he was here on the earth. So I'm going to start with Acts 1.1. It says, the first account, uh, I composed the, uh, co uh, Theopolis about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. For these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proof appeared, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait what the Father has promised talking about the Holy Spirit. And so when you go over here to the ninth verse of the first chapter of Acts, it says, and after he had said these things, 
he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of, the, out of their sight. And as they were gazing intensely into the sky, while he was going, uh, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This saying, uh, this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go up into heaven. Praise God for the Bible. I read from you the New Testament and the Old Testament that talks about Jesus landing his feet on the Mount of Olives. Praise be to God. That's the reason why it's good to study the Bible and to understand these things. For those who have been to Israel and know where the Mount of Olives is, I know where Jesus is going to be appearing to. And when he appears on the Mount of Olives, everybody shall see him. It shall be clear on what is going on. So when we come back to Revelation, um, uh, I wanted to, to you know set that in order because for me, when I look at who is this child that the devil is trying to kill, trying to kill Jesus, we know that Jesus suffered on the cross, not because the devil had, uh, uh, the devil um, uh, uh, conquered Jesus. No, it was part of the process. It was a part of the process for our salvation that Jesus Christ said, I come because that I know I will die. And the Bible was clear when you go back to Luke that he was a, 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 a revelation, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And, and, and to me, when I, when I think about those kind of verses, man, it just brings shivers up my spine because in the, in the book of Luke, it says that everything that talks about Jesus, it talks about Jesus uh, in the prophetic, but it also talks about Jesus that now that he's come, He's no longer a baby. He's not in a manger. Uh, he's no longer walking this earth. He has ascended up, and he is with the Almighty God. The Bible said he's at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, every prayer, everything that we think, everything that we talk about, you know, the Holy Ghost brings all things into our remembrance. It also gives us visions. The Holy Ghost helps us in all things. It also helps our prayers when we're praying and when we're praying, trying to get to God. Remember, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father to be an advocate for us. Jesus is, is an advocate for us as we pray. And it doesn't matter if it's millions of people or, or, or tens of millions of people, 10 billions of people. It doesn't matter. Jesus in heaven hears every prayer, understand what is going on for all of us, and God hears us all. And the Bible says our prayers go up as a sweet-smelling savor or as incense unto God as we begin to praise God, as we begin to pray unto God, as we begin to uh, worship Him. So keep that in mind. So I wanted to make sure that when I'm talking about these things, I'm going to the passages. The Bible says in Luke, in Luke the second chapter, uh, um, the second chapter, uh, 30, 30, uh, 32nd verse or 32 verse. It says, A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. I said, Praise be to God. God didn't just think about the people. This is the prophetic word of Simeon when he saw Jesus for the first time. He said, A light of revelation to the Gentiles. That includes me. I wish I could say I'm Jewish. I'm not. But a light of revelation to the Gentiles. So I am not excluded from salvation. How do I know? Because God allowed the gospel to come to me. God allowed the gospel to come to you. God allowed us to be included into his heavenly kingdom by faith. And so not only by faith, God gave us the ability and the will to get faith. Oh, praise be to God. I'm so thankful for understanding this word and putting this word together, even for you. Here's something I want to read. The 33rd verse in uh, Luke, the second chapter, it says, And his father and mother were amazed at the things were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the, foul, for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end 
that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Imagine having to hear a prophetic word like that concerning your son. So again, when I look at Revelation and look at the uh, Revelation, the 12th chapter, and it talks about, and she gave birth to a, ma a son, a male child. He is to rule all of the nations with a rod of iron. We're talking about nobody else but Jesus Christ. And a child was caught up to God and to his throne. And his throne was talking about the ascension back into heaven from the Mount of Olives. Praise be to God. And the Bible said the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so there would be nourished for 1,260 days. What did that 1,260 days mean? Well, it's talking about the, the second half of the tribulation. We know that the tribulation period lasts for a period of seven years. And for seven years, there will be suffering. Um, uh, when, when the Antichrist come on the scene, the Antichrist, along with the, the devil and also the false prophet, they will promise peace to the Jews, to the um, uh, uh, Middle East. They will bring us about such a peace that they would be enjoying a peace for a time of three and a half years. And at some point, at the midpoint of that seven years, which is three and a half years, all hell breaks loose out on the Jewish nation. And there was a total 180 degree turn that the Antichrist will begin to stop the temple of worship. He'll stop many things that he agreed to do. And all of a sudden now he's going to attack the Jews and they will die in many. And, and, and I mean, we thought that the, the Holocaust was something this despicts, um, uh, despicts a, a scene so horrific that it makes the Holocaust look like it was nothing. And, I, and I'm sad to say that, and I don't mean to say that in any disrespectful way, but as we're reading Revelation, it is letting us know that whatever's going to come that's going to be brought on by Satan and that unholy trinity is going to be massive. And it's going to be that they're going to come against the Jewish nation and the people of God with a fierce hatred. And that fierce hatred is going to kill millions. Has this time happened yet? No. Is it coming? At some point it will. And when it does come, we have to be prepared for it. And so the whole reason why we are really trying to make sure that we understand what is happening with you and what's happening with each other and what we need to know about Revelation is so we could avoid being in this kind of situation. Well, I'm going to talk about the rapture at some other point, but not today. The, the, today is to get you to understand as you understand revelation and begin to study it you don't want to be here during these times that 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 the antichrist the power of satan is here the false prophets are here and the false prophets um are, uh, are causing people to take the mark of the beast in their right hand on their foreheads you don't want to be around at that time so as we go on to to Revelation 12 and 7, the, the topic of this particular portion of this passage says Satan thrown down out of heaven, and I'm going to explain that here in a little detail. Number 7 says, and there was a war in heaven, Michael, his angels, waging war with the dragon. Raging war with who? The dragon. The dragon and his angels raged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found from them in heaven. Oh, this is such a wonderful blessing to read this for me. I'm going to tell you why. We know that we believe at the Kingdom of Grace Ministries and other uh, Christians, we believe in the rapture. Not all Christians believe in the rapture. Some people, uh, uh, they don't believe it. They don't think it's going to happen. Um, and so they're thinking that we're going to usher in the kingdom of God just through going through trials and tribulation and so on and so forth. That's, and, and, and these are Christians that believe that. You also have a group of people that believe what we call premillennial um, 
uh, the rapture of the church taking place before the tribulation period, then you have some people thinking that the rapture is going to take place in the middle of the tribulation period or in the middle of all that um, the chaos, what I mentioned, the three and a half years. Then you think some people are thinking that the second coming of Jesus would be the rapture. So you have different opinions from scholars on those things. What we believe at the Kingdom of Grace Ministries is what we consider pre-tribulation. In other words, we won't go through the tribulation period. We'll be caught up into heaven. We'll be caught up. We will be raptured away. Now, as I explain that, being raptured away, in order for us to get through the air or get in through the system to get to God, there had to be a passageway or a gateway to open up for us to be able to get to heaven. I know some people don't understand all what I'm saying, but let me break it down like this. Satan is not going to let you just waltz on into heaven. That's not what he's going to do. If we go back even to the book of Daniel, we understand that even in the book of Daniel, when, when Daniel was praying and he went on a fast and he prayed, he was praying 21 days and all of a sudden, um, a Gabriel, uh, we know that an angel appeared to him and the angel appeared to him with the mindset of delivering a word to him because the word he was delivering to him was a word from the Lord. And we go on to know that this angel that was talking to Daniel, just talking to Daniel, he said that, look here, I heard you the very first day that you prayed. And so, you know, people talk about the Daniel fast and everything like that. I kind of laugh at some of that stuff because we understand that, that Daniel didn't have to pray fast for 21 days, but he did. And as he was praying and praying those 21 days, we know through scripture that as an angel appeared to him, he told him, he said, I heard you the very first day that you prayed. But also, he reminded Daniel, he says that while you were praying, I came to, to bring, deliver a message to you. And that's in the book of Daniel, the 10th ch chapter. I'm not going to go to it right now and read it. But he was saying, I was sent to you to deliver a message to you. But as I was trying to get this message to you, I had to fight with the prince of the air. And as I'm fighting with the prince of the air, who is that? Satan, the devil. And he was fighting, but he said, I couldn't fight with the devil and then also deliver the message. So I had to call Michael, the archangel, to help me and to fight with me uh, so that I can deliver the message unto you. And so now, as I bring this message to you, I could bring this message to you and then get back to what I needed to do. So this is in the book of Daniel. So we're going to read it, but let me go to Daniel, the 10th chapter. And I'm going to read briefly uh, the 10th chapter of Daniel and go down to uh, uh, the 12th verse. Then he said to me, do not be afraid. Oh, no, let me go with number 10. Then behold, a hand touched me. Daniel 10, 10. He says, behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, oh, Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I am about to tell you. And stand upright for and for uh, that I'm about to tell you and stand up upright for I have now been sent to you. And when he has spoken these words to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on Humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your word. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I have been left there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days for the vision pertaining to the days yet future. Oh, uh, this is amazing. Again, again, we are looking at Daniel that talks to us about the future events that's about to come 
that is in alignment with Revelation telling us about these things. So as I break this down, the Bible says, and there was a war in heaven, just like it was in the days of Daniel. There was a war in heaven. This time the Bible said that it wasn't Gabriel coming or another archangel coming. This battle is Michael and his angels bringing war against against the dragon. And for all you that don't know, devil, the devil and his demons, they have control of the air, of the airways, of the stratosphere. They control that stratosphere. In other words, they can fly. They can fly here and there. The devil is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at the same time. The devil will only dwell in a stronghold on where he can be. And that stronghold will be a place where the concentration of evil and the concentration of sin and unbelief is at its strongest. Right now, my commentary to you is that that place right now is Russia. And the Bible kind of tells us about that when it talks about the prince of Meshet and Tobol. And what area is that? The land of the north or Russia itself. So in that land... When you look at Putin controlling that, you look at there's no churches, you got uh, atheism, you got all this stronghold of, of sin that's hanging right there in Russia and how they do things and how they operate. So Satan hovers in that region, which is a stronghold. He also sends his strongest prince of demonic force to, to reign and wreak havoc in Israel. Satan could, he can't be both places at one time, so he have to be one or the other. And so therefore, he chooses to be at the strongest place he can be. And thus, he governs over the air of the territory of Russia. And then when we get to uh, Ezekiel at some point, we'll explain that a little bit more. But we find that here it is that in Revelation, the 12th chapter, Michael and his archangels come down now and they fight with the devil or fight with Satan in the middle of the air. And he's fighting with these angels in the middle of the air. And the Bible said, and they lost the battle and they were thrown down to the ground. In other words, demons are flying and they're going to and fro. They control the air. But because the rapture is going to take place, and I truly believe this, that in order for us to be raptured up <clears throat> and have a passageway to get to heaven, the Bible said that Satan is thrown down. And so now he's thrown down. He doesn't control the airwaves. All his demons just fall to the ground. And as they fall down to the ground, it clears a path for us to be raptured up. Oh, praise God. And as it clears that path for us to be raptured up, now what's happening? The Bible says that woe unto the earth because the devil is thrown down to the ground and he knows that he only have a short period of time to operate and to do his dirty work and to do his bidding. And when he comes down, he's coming down with all fury, with all hell. He's coming to destroy mankind. And as we go through the book of Revelation, you will see the evidence of that through John's vision and through his dreams on how terrible uh, Satan will be operating when he possesses the man who would be known as the Antichrist. Again, as I read, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no place found for them in heaven because they were thrown down. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And that's the reason why you want to get into heaven. That's the reason why you want to get to the rapture. You want to be in the rapture. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we that which remain and which we are alive, uh, we will have a changed body. Our body will change to a glorified body. And then we would raise up and meet the, the, the dead in Christ rising first. We'll meet the Lord, I'll say, with him. And then there will be judgment seat. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ will happen in the middle of the air as we begin to happen and we to get our rewards and things like that. So it's going to be a wonderful time, a wonderful place. But you need to be caught up. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but it talks about the catching away. And this is what we mean by the catching away. Now, don't everybody believe what I just said, but at the end of the day, if you start reading the scriptures and putting it together, you will see not only that it's symbolic, as you go back to Daniel, 
there was an actual war that he was being stopped from getting into bringing the message to Daniel. But he said, I had to call Michael, the archangel, to fight for me because I had to fight with the devil 21 days. Wouldn't like I wasn't strong enough. He was fighting with the devil, but at the same time, he had to deliver the message. He said, I had to call Michael to fight with him just to clear a path so I could come down here and deliver this message. Oh, praise be to God. Don't you know that God give angels charge over you? He also wants you to know, sometimes you praying and you keep praying, you thinking that's not an answer, just keep on praying. And like Daniel, I would say also fast. I don't say you have to fast 21 days, I just say just fast. And as you fast and pray to get your message through or to get your prayer through, you don't know what's stopping you, so keep on praying. Keep on holding on, I walk by faith, not by sight. And I love this fact that, that the devil was thrown down. In other words, they could fly. But in this period of time when they're thrown down, and I want to say at the time of the rapture, they won't be able to fly. That means they'll be, be walking around. They'll be possessing people. Uh, we know uh, a demon possession. And so now people talk about zombies and the apocalypse and all that stuff. I would say that's somewhat real because if you don't have the mark of God on your heart in your life during that tribulation time, and for the most part, if you've been raptured up and you've been caught up, that means you got left behind. And if you got left behind, because you wouldn't a full overcomer. And if you're not a full overcomer, you're going to be here and be subject to the same deception, be subject to the same things that the unbelievers will be uh, subject to. The difference is that those, and, and, and let me you know, say this, and I won't say hypothetically, but there will be some people that will be left behind and won't make the rapture. And then they're going to know that they were left behind and they didn't make the rapture. But here's the thing. God is still merciful. God is still gracious. Now, you missed the rapture and you were like, oh man, I wouldn't have full overcome. I didn't really do what I needed to do. And now you still believe in God. The Bible says if you take the mark of the beast, then you're doomed. If you take a mark of the beast in your hand and your forehead, you're doomed. You're doomed for the great white throne judgment. But if you say, you know what? I know I missed the rapture, but I, I, I can't accept the mark of the beast. Then you will be killed. You will be massacred. And the form of killing during that time will be some form of beheading and, or some kind of guillotine or something like that. They will be beheading people. Why I'm saying that? Because it's, it's going to be a terror tactic for people to want to wanna avoid being beheaded. And so they're going to want to take the mark of the beast because it's going to be gruesome. It's going to be really uh, 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 gross. That's the word I'm looking for. It's going to be gross and grotesque. And, and I'm going to say something that is not going to be pleasant, but imagine someone's head getting chopped off. It's not clean and pretty. You chop off a person's head, I mean, there's going to be blood splattering everywhere. That Your heart going to be pumping blood all over the place. It's going to be a messy scene. So, again, don't think that you're going to make it through always going to be peaches and cream if you miss the rapture. It won't be. It's going to be terror. It's going to be horror. It's going to be something that you really just don't want to be a part of. And I'm saying to you, if you understand that, then be a part of the rapture. How do you be a part of the rapture? Keep God's commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. The second is like the first. Love your neighbor like you love you. Yeah, you got to repent. Lord, I surrender. I forgive me of all my sins. And then live right. And when you don't live right, keep trying to live right. You fall down and get yourself right back up and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that he is Lord and Savior of your life and of the world. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and glory to the land and the nation of, of Israel. Remember that. It goes on to say here in the 10th verse, Then I heard a voice, a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren have been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heaven, and you who 
dwell in them. But listen at this voice. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. Again, when you miss the rapture, and when the devil is thrown down to the ground, uh, oh, woe. Woe unto you. In other words, when somebody say woe unto you, it's going to be a terrible time, a time of persecution, a time of tribulation. And you have to understand that that's exactly what it's going to be. And you got to be able to know without thinking about it that when you're in that season, when the full fury, not the demons flying around in the sky going to and fro, it's going to be concentrated. When they fall, when they drop, and when they, wherever they drop, they're dropping down right there out of the sky. They're going to be in, uh, possessing people. They're going to be indwelling in people. They're going to be influencing the thoughts and minds of people. And people will not be talking about getting saved. People are not going to be talking about church. The only church that will truly exist during that time is the apostate church. We'll talk about that at another time. And the apostate church will be a false church. It'll be the church that talks about God, it looks like it's talking about God, but they're not going to be talking about serving God. The whole problem is that they're going to be about controlling, and that whole control is going to be basically the control of the church system will be controlled by the false prophet. The false prophet will also turn all attention and all power to the, anti, to the Antichrist. So then that's where you have the, the unholy trinity. You have Satan the dragon, you have the Antichrist, who is to be worshipped like he's Christ. Then you have the false prophet who will control all of the things and do signs and wonders, just like prophets will do, but he is a part of the unholy trinity. And you would think that it's God, but it won't be God. It's all a deception. It's all a rouge. It's all designed to deceive you and to um, uh, cause you to serve and to wonder uh, after the beast and to worship the image of his name. So you need to be very careful, those that if you're left behind, you will be deceived. The Bible said if it was possible, even the very elect would be deceived. In the last minutes I have here, verse 13 says, And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman, which is Israel, who gave birth to the male child, talking about Israel, but the two wings of a great eagle was given to the woman or to Israel to be confident or to be in a safe zone so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was a nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Again, let me say this again as we talk about the uh, 1260 days. For 1260 days, it's going to appear like it's peace and prosperity. Uh, the Jews will build their temple. The temple will be built somewhere in Israel. When they build that temple, they'll start the temple worship. As they're beginning to have temple worship and going on, all of this is going to be approved and the authority that's given to the Antichrist. He's going to bring peace in that region. He's going to be bring peace in, around the world. He's going to bring in inventions and things that are going to be looking like peace on earth. It's going to look so wonderful and glorious. But that's only going to happen for three and a half years. For the Jews, it's going to be wonderful. They're going to think that this person is the Messiah. And then when they open up their temple, this person comes into the temple. He comes into the temple only to defile the temple, which is the desolation that we talk about. The desolation of that temple. And the de desolation of that temple uh, will be one where the Jews will wake up and realize that they've been deceived. And when they realize that, oh my, we've been deceived, then they're going to want to tear their clothes and realize we would see. Well, now you've got the scattering of the people. And all of a sudden now you've got the, the, the power and the authority of this dictator, the Antichrist, is now not only pursuing the Jews, he's pursuing the Jews because he won't worship, they won't worship him as the Messiah. Now many will turn their back and say, no, we've been duped. And now he will pursue them to kill them, to master them, just like Hitler did in World War II. And it's going to be massive. And not only just the Jews, he's going to be killing every, off everybody who's called themselves Christians or associated with Christianity, associated with some type of religion. He'll be killing people left and right. 
It's going to be a gruesome scene. And the Bible says here that, that it's going to be so bad that even God have to allow for peace as the people of God being scattered at some point. They're scattered for the sake of protection. And as God protects them, whether they go into the desert or go into Damascus or wherever they flee to, as we read in Zechariah, half the city of Jerusalem would be, be uh, 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 ravished and plundered because of this army coming against it. And so God said, even during that time, we have all this turmoil and tribulation. I will still protect my people in that time of, of, of a tribulation time. Number 15, and the, then the serpent poured water out. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after Israel, the woman, so that he may cause her to be swept away like a flood. The Bible says when the enemy come in like a flood, the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. Remember that. And we see that whenever you talk about a flood or water, thing, that, that battle you can't contain. And this is exactly what the enemy was doing. But if you go back to what I read in Zechariah, the Bible said that God allowed an an uh, enemy, uh, enemy army to encamp against Jerusalem, to camp against Israel. But just when they thought that it was going to conquer, then all of a sudden we see that Jesus Christ returns back on the scene. He steps down and is placing his feet on uh, the Mount of Olives. And so we'll get into that another time. Number 16 says, but the earth helped the woman and the earth opened his mouth, maybe with an earthquake or something, and drank up the river or drank up the river. When I think of, I think about the Bible and Ezekiel talk about earthquakes Earthquakes happening, when we look at, talk about Armageddon or the Battle of Armageddon, same thing in the earth, there's earthquakes that's happening uh, in that time. So that's kind of what I think it means that there's going to be an earthquake that f swallows up the army as it goes in to, um, to come against Israel. Now, now I want to make sure I make a clarification, can't get into it right now for the sake of time, but there will be what I consider to be two major wars coming. One war will be World War III. World War III will be a war that could possibly happen in our lifetime that we see that's happening right now with this battle between Israel and Hamas, the Houthi rebels, and also um, Hezbollah. And we know that Iran is behind all this, so you have to be aware of that. Well, we know that Iran hates the United States of America, hates Israel, and so their whole goal is to wreak havoc in that region. So they're never going to stop trying to wreak havoc. I believe that that, which is a, a, a regional war, will begin to expand and start getting other people involved in this war. The once Russia gets involved, the United States is going to get involved. Uh, once other people start getting involved, Saudi Arabia start getting involved. So you start having all these people getting involved. Now you have, you're on the cusp of World War III. This is not the Battle of Armageddon. Not at all. So you have World War Three will come that will wreak havoc in that land. And then at some point, that would all clear up. And as things clear up, then you have another greater war that is coming about that is going to happen after the seven-year tribulation. And then after the seven-year tribulation, that would be the battle of Armageddon that will usher in Jesus Christ coming on this earth. So I just want to make that very clear. World War Three won't usher in Jesus coming. But you will have earthquakes. You will have the mighty arm of God protecting Israel. And by some miraculous uh, event, uh, the army that comes around Israel during World War III will swallow up the armies and will destroy the armies. It won't be when Jesus comes. It will be, the, I would call it World War III just for the sake of giving it a name. But World War III will come. And all of a sudden now, God miraculously saved his people, Israel. And so now they say, but that doesn't mean that the that the war is over. It's not totally over. The Bible says in Ezekiel, they'll be going around and burying bodies for a period of time. And then there will be the great war that comes up and that would be the battle of Armageddon. So we'll, we'll talk about that another time. The last thing says, number 17. So the dragon was enraged when the woman, with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keeps the commandments of God and, the, and holds to the testimony of Jesus. So it's time for me to stop right there. I hope that this Bible study was um, 
informative and we kind of cleared up some questions for you. Um, if you have any questions that you want me to answer, uh, please um, email uh, Kingdom of Grace. Uh, you go to the Kingdom of Grace web page and um, I think it's kgmparaland at gmail.com and um, we'll just send your questions to us there and we'll be more than happy to uh, answer your questions or you can even send them by email uh, to admin, uh, Kingdom of Grace admin. I think the uh, website is there as well. So you can do that and we'll be able to get information back to you and I'll be able to answer all questions uh, during that time is our next Bible study on Tuesday of um, uh, next week. So we'll be joining uh, with you on t every Tuesday uh, throughout the year uh, at 7 p.m. Central Time. So God bless you. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye now.